Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another entry of our Biodiversity Days 2020 here at California State Parks. We're here in the Colorado Desert District, and we're up here at Palomar Mountain State Park. My name is William, and I'm a state park interpreter here at the park, and I'm joined here with Mike. How are you, how you doing today, Will? Doing um, good. My name is Mike Fuzo. I am an uh, environmental scientist with the um, Colorado Desert District. So that includes uh, Cleomaca Rancho State Park, Palomar Mountain State Park, and Anza Borrego Desert State Park. All right. And we have Mike here today to help us explore some of the interesting facts and opportunities for research around mountain lions. So mountain lions are a particularly interesting animal here on the mountain. We get lots of questions about them. Mm -hmm. When's the last time we had sightings? Mm -hmm. So I think I, the first thing I'll ask you is how did you get into researching mountain lions or, or the, the study of mountain lions? Um, well, I first have a degree in wildlife management from the University of New Hampshire. Um, and from there, I worked a number of seasonal jobs of, around the country. And um, I was out on a job on Catalina Island, and one of my supervisors was a um, was working with UC Davis on the uh, early stages of the mountain lion research here in Southern California, uh, which began in 2001. And um, it just through those connections, whatever, and through the hard work and the degree and whatnot, I was able to get a job um, starting in 2004, and for about four years was involved in the um, uh, Southern California mountain lion project working for UC Davis. Excellent. All right. So um, when we when we think about mountain lions, they they definitely like to live up here at Palomar, mm -hmm. and it's we think that's because of the habitat. So what can you speak to, what can you say about the habitat here that makes it such a good place for mountain lions to live? Yeah, I mean, it basically all boils down to like food and habitat cover. So um, the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife has a habitat suitability map for the entire state. And what it does is it basically identifies the different parts of the state that have the different qualities of habitat, from low grade to high grade. And throughout here, in the Palomars, in the Lagunas, in the Cleomacas, we have some of that highest grade of mountain lion habitat. And all has to do with mountain lion, or, uh, excuse me, all has to do with deer, their primary food source. So if the deer are existing at a high density, then the mountain lions are going to have plenty of food to survive and to go about their, um, to go about their, to go about their lives. Makes sense. You know? Yeah. And also, um, I guess, the other thing I wanted to, to ask about, this is more of a personal question that I have, is <laughs> habitat preference. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, let's, I've heard that mountain lions really like to, um, they like to hunt in more chaparral or open areas versus a dense forest. Mm -hmm. What do you, do you have any information or I guess, uh, what would they prefer? Because we have lots of dense forests here at Palomar, but we also have sort of broad hills with chaparral and boulders. Mm -hmm. So basically anywhere that a lion can find cover to ambush from, I they're see. opportunistic um, uh, ambush predators. So they're going to be traveling throughout their home ranges. They are going to be taking the path of least resistance so that they can traverse like these huge, huge areas. So in Southern California, females have a home range of about 80 to 90 square miles. Wow. Males in these densely forested areas have home ranges of at least 150 uh, maybe upwards of 200, 250 square miles. Now, in the desert, wow. out in the Santa Rosas, in the uh, uh, Vallecitos, in the um, uh, San Ysidro Mountains of Anza Brego Desert State Park, where there are bighorn sheep, the sheep exist at much less, much lower densities, and so the lions have to range over huge, huge areas. Female might range over 600 square miles, a male maybe 800 That's square incredible. miles. That's incredible. Just a massive amounts of area that they are traversing to find enough food. And, but here, we've got really good um, deer density. And so the mountain lion is an indicator species, um, the top of the food chain. And so we can have an understanding that if the, if the mountain lion population is healthy, then as you work your way down through that food chain, the deer and so the vegetation and so on and so forth, everything is more or less how it should be right. because the mountain lions are at a healthy um, population, healthy level. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So I know that... As humans continue to develop, mm -hmm. we, we continue to build out, um, we start to see more interactions with mountain lions. Where I, I believe, I've, I've read that the, the number of interactions between mountain lions and humans is increasing mm -hmm. because we've been developing and their ha habitat has been shrinking yes. and fragmenting. So can you, can you speak to that? Yeah. So the three uh, biggest detriments to mountain lions in the state is one that you mentioned, habitat. 
uh, loss, fragmentation, development, urbanization, urban sprawl as it moves out into the wild areas. So that would be number one. Um, vehicle uh, collisions, so road mortality, and then also uh, depredation. Hey, Mike here. Just want to interject one thing. Habitat loss and fragmentation is the overarching problem, and underneath that we have uh, depredation, we have vehicle collisions, and we have uh, genetic depression or inbreeding as the major causes of mortality for mountain lions throughout the state of California. And depredation is when mountain lions kill a domestic animal, um, and then a person has the legal right to request a permit from the state, and then they will come in and they will kill the animal. They will kill the, the uh, mountain lion. And this and this goes for coyotes and bears, anything that you know uh, causes damage to private property. Now, if we look at um, I'll just take uh, uh, depredation to begin with. So these are uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife numbers, um, and these are minimum numbers. Um, in the 2000, so like 2000 to 2010, in the San in the county of San Diego, there were um, I believe it was about 10 or 12 of these permits issued. Uh, so there was 10 or 12 um, incidents where mountain lions had killed domestic animals, and then the uh, the landowner requested from the state to get one of these permits, and of those 10 or 12, I think there was about seven mountain lions that were killed as a result of these permits. Uh, go forward a decade, and those numbers increased dramatically. Mm. And so from 2011 to 2019, there was 44 of these permits issued and 34 mountain lions killed. And these are, these are minimum numbers. You know, sometimes there might be a permit that, you know, doesn't get documented for whatever the case might be. Um, but again, so that's, that's one example of uh, these uh, these uh, issues, and again, it all relates to habitat loss and fragmentation. As as people continue to develop, um, and the chances of humans and lions um, uh, coming in contact with one another, um, people having um, more you know goats and, and hobby animals and things like that in some of these rural areas, um, there's just more opportunity for the lion to either be killing a domestic animal, and so the depredation permit to be issued, or um, roadkill. And so for lions to be hit and killed uh, by vehicles on whether it's Interstate 15 or Interstate 8 or any any major thoroughfare that goes throughout um, that goes throughout the county. Right. Um, yeah, and I know that we we occasionally do see some roadkill up here at Palomar. Not mm -hmm. no no mountain lions, but just a good reminder to you know watch your keep your speed at a good distance, at least out here in these mountainous roads. Not mm -hmm. so much luck on those interstates. I mean that's yeah. pretty random. But there are ways that we can try to ameliorate that, right? We can try and lessen the, the amount of roadkill that's happening. And mm -hmm. I believe that's with corridors, right? Right, yeah. So with corridors, so um, one example that's been successful in um, San Diego County, or not in San Diego County, but in Southern California, was that on the 241 toll road that is in Orange County, they reduced overall wildlife mortality by 98% wow. by putting in this, these big fencing structures. And what it does is it was fencing to keep wildlife off the roads. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, reduction of 98%. That also reduces um, the vehicle collisions, which then reduce, you know, injuries to humans and so on and so forth. So definitely very beneficial. Yeah, good for both sides. Absolutely, 100%. Um, now, sp uh, speaking to, like, the wildlife corridors, they have been used a lot in Canada. They've been used a lot in, like, um, uh, the upper parts of the United States and Montana and things like that. Um, there are proposals for two corridors that I know of here in Southern California. One that is right here, kind of in our backyard, would connect the Palomars to the Santa Ana Mountains. Um, this this uh, corridor that's right near, that's in the um, Temecula area, mm. that goes uh, basically the um, Santa Margarita Ecological Reserve. Um, and this is, this, is, this is really important because mountain lions in California have been... Um, Human population increase and in urban sprawl and just and just the growth of the population of California has created these essentially these ten subpopulations of mountain lions throughout the entire state, and four of those are here in Southern California. We have the the uh, Eastern Peninsula Range, which is where we are right now. We have the Santa Ana Range. We have the Santa Ana subpopulation, the Santa Monica subpopulation, and then the San Bernardino subpopulation. The, the Santa Ana and the Santa Monica subpopulations are two of, of the most are, are two are the two most genetically depressed within 
California, meaning there's a lot of inbreeding going on. Think of Florida Panthers, right? The little kinks in the tails. You're going to have uh, coats that have different characteristics, whatever, because there's a lot of inbreeding that goes on. That inbreeding depression over time can lead to extirpation, local extinction of animals from those particular regions. So what UC Davis, what the Nature Conservancy, uh, working with Caltrans and engineers from one of the Cal states, what they've been doing is they've been working on how to construct one of these corridors that goes from the Santa Anas to the Palomars so that they can maintain some genetic diversity and genetic flow between those two subpopulations to essentially save the Santa Ana population. Now, the research has shown that you need to have at least one animal going from population A to population B every one to two years so that you can maintain genetic diversity. Seems pretty reasonable, right? At least one animal every one to two years. But what the research has shown is that, take the Santa Ana population for example, that in the past 15 years only, there's only been one documented lion to have successfully moved between these between these subpopulations of mountain lions. Hmm. So if that continues, then estimates are that that Santa Ana population could go become locally extinct in the next 10 years or so. Wow. If there isn't anything done. So right. why it's critically important to create those corridors right. and why it's critically important to have areas like Anzabrego and Cuyamaca and Palomar and these public lands, Forest Service County, wherever the case might be, these protected areas that are going to be protected in perpetuity they're going to be able to maintain these large tracts of high quality habitat. They're going to be able to continue to allow these natural processes to occur over time, you know, for the greatest amount of biodiversity, species richness, so on and so forth, so that these areas can essentially be what's called a sink, or excuse me, a source population, where they can essentially have um, a greater number of animals, um, you know, uh, that, that survive, right? Mm -hmm. And then they, and that can disperse to these areas that need help, essentially, right? And ideally doing it um, with this corridor as opposed to like physically moving animals from point A to point B and just letting the animals do it on their own as they're, as they're designed to do. Right. Um, these, and it's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's particularly important to do that for, because like once the males, so a female, once she has her offspring, she takes care of them for about 18 months, maybe two years in that, in that neighborhood, generally 18 months. Um, and then at that point they disperse. The female offspring, they typically stay within that area. Uh, they know the resources really well. It makes them more successful at raising their own offspring. Mm. But the males, they got to go. They're going to go 100 miles in any direction, you know, whatever, more or less, to try and find a place where they can set up their habitat. So they're making these long pushes in a given direction. And if they head north, if they head along the Palomars and head north and hit the 15, you know, good chances, you know, chances are that they're going to get hit by a car trying to cross that, trying to cross that freeway. So if there is that corridor, um, then you know we can you know provide for we have this genetic um, source here that can then be infused into the Santa Ana population and then can help to sustain that population in perpetuity. Great, yeah. yeah, I have high hopes for that. Me I too. really, <laughs> I really want our 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 populations, especially predators, top of the food chain predators yeah. that are responsible for keeping other populations like deer in check. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really have high hopes for them being able to. You know, take things natural and yep. have to be, keep the natural course of life. Yeah. So, um, and just to just to touch on yeah. that real quick. So, you talk about like the lions um, uh, keeping in check the deer population, right? Like, right. I'm from the East Coast, and there we don't have any big predators. Like, they've all been extirpated: mm. wolves, mountain lions, so on and so forth. So, there, there's very little. The browse line where deer have fed on is essentially like six feet tall. It's yeah. about six feet high in the sense that they've browsed everything. So there's a reduction in biodiversity because the deer populations haven't been held in check by a top level predator. And so then they can overeat, you know, an area, um, which then is not good for the deer because when it comes to winter time, um, there, there can be, and there have been cases where animals, you know, there's high numbers of animals that starve to death uh, because there just isn't that food. So, you got that mountain line up here at the top of the food chain. It keeps in check the deer so that they have enough to eat and so that they right. don't then, you know, have any sort of uh, uh, drop offs themselves because of starvation or, you know, you know, um, in the winter. And then again, it just works down the food chain. Right. Yeah. yeah. So with all that being said, all this really, really fan uh, interesting and fantastic information, um, 
how do we how can we actually uh, study these animals? Like, mm -hmm. what are some of the methods and equipment that might go into understanding the lifestyle of a mountain lion? Yeah. Um, so it basically collars mm -hmm. and radio telemetry and GPS data that are going to allow you to learn about an individual lion, but then also the population of lions. Um, you know, originally old school, it was a, a radio telemetry where you had to um, triangulate each individual lion, and you might have only been able to get, you know, a couple locations on an individual animal, and this is for whether it's lions or bears or deer or elk or moose, wherever the case might be, um, but you might only be able to get a couple individuals on, or a couple locations on that individual over the course of the week. That's with the radio collar. That's with those old school radio collars where, yeah, the collar just puts off a beacon, just a yes. beacon. Right now, they have, <laughs> And, and the GPS technology has just, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. In my phone, in everybody's phone. Exactly, yeah. And so you can, so in the same way that sensor your phone tracks you, mm -hmm. right, these collars will track these animals and then you can set the collar to take a location every hour, every day, every minute, every five minutes, whatever you want to program it for, depending on what your questions are. So if you want to know exactly where a lion is crossing so you can identify a corridor so that you can connect these subpopulations, then you want really fine data every five minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever the case might be. So you can basically almost like walk with that lion, you know, down a path, right, and know exactly where it is. And a lot of times, you know, in, in these, these collars, they might send that data on a daily basis to a satellite. Satellite sends it to your phone or to your computer. You tap it up every morning, you're like, oh man, this lion went down this drainage or this ridge top, whatever yesterday, wherever the case might be. Yes. So it gives you some really, really good up-to-date data. So you can look at an individual in that regard. You can see where and when they're making kills, when the females are having offspring. And then from a population standpoint, you can see when males and females are getting together and having offspring. You can see who's related to who. Um, you know, and then you kind of back that up when you catch the animal, you take some blood. There's a lot of uh, genetic analysis that's done. And then you can kind of build these you know, uh, family trees essentially, and see who's related to who on the landscape and how genes spread from point A to point B on the landscape. Yeah, I'm sure researchers get to know these cats pretty well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So, um, I guess let's wrap things up with talking about how, if you at home are watching this and you're like, wow, this sounds fascinating, I would love to do this in my line of work. Mm -hmm. How could somebody try to go about doing that? Yeah. So, um, First thing, um, you need at least a bachelor's, and in today's day and age, you're probably going to need a more advanced degree than that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, starting off getting an undergraduate degree in, you know, something wildlife management related, conservation related, uh, conservation biology, environmental science, something along those lines, um, and tons of experience. For me, I learn way better in the field doing than I do at a desk, um, and so I. I gain most of my knowledge and most of my experience from actually getting as many jobs as I can, travel all over the country, you know, travel all around the world, getting as many experiences as you can, learning from a whole bunch of different people, um, and then just kind of using that to kind of then just find out like, you know, what your what your style is and what your philosophies are and, and so on and so forth, and then applying that to, you know, you know, state parks, we do a lot of land management. You know, other agencies are more species specific. Um, more species driven or you might get into the research aspect which is you know out asking whatever sort of question you want to ask but there's lots of different avenues that you can go once you have that degree once you have that experience obviously working your tail off you know just just you know just working really hard to you know get yourself to where you where you want to be right yeah excellent yeah. well this has been a really fascinating awesome uh, conversation Mike uh, yeah. I always Always thrilled to learn more about the cats here, the mountain lions. So thank you so much for joining us yeah, up here at Palomar. Yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in to this, our, our interview. And want to remind you all to get out there yourself and, you know, go see what you can find. Biodiversity Days is all about gathering data and seeing what is around us. Just seeing all the different varieties of, of species of organisms that live here in San Diego. And we have a lot of biodiversity here. So just another reminder as we wrap things up this week to head out there with your iNaturalist app or even just a journal or a camera and document what you can find and share your knowledge, share your data with everyone here in San Diego. And we can build a, a, a nice big biodiversity map of what we have here in our, in our wonderful county. So thanks again, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See you guys.